Thomas. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the director for the African American Regions and Cultural Center. And in the vein of liberation and true intentions, I want to acknowledge the land on which the universe, university gathers as the unceded territory of the Awaswas speaking UP tribe of the Amamutsun tribal band. Let's continue to take care of each other and distribute good energy and love throughout this really challenging and unprecedented time. And of course, while I most certainly wish that we could gather in person to do this opportunity um, to talk a little bit more about the experiences of our ADS and ABC identified students that travel abroad, um, we're, we're in a situation where we are doing the best that we can. And I really applaud each and every one of you for taking time to join myself and my co, which I'll introduce in a second, as well as our panelists. So thank you so much for tuning in. Um, we hope you can stay towards the end. Uh, a little bit of breakdown of today, and I think Ashley will do this in a bit, but we're going to do some brief introduction. Um, Ashley will give you some really sound content and context for the experiences at, abroad, and then we have some amazing students that have joined us today to talk about their experiences. So with that, I've already mentioned her a little bit, so I want to applaud my lovely, amazing co, um, Ashley. This, this is a co-partnership between the Study Abroad Office and Ashley Bayman has come to me and really talked about you know, her, her commitment and investment in not only providing all of our students with the opportunity to study abroad, but really making sure, again, that there's more parity in the folks that are exploring these options. So Ashley has been a great thought partner for the course of, over the course of the last couple of years, a really great um, colleague to work with, and I'm super excited to be able to host this event again. This is our second time doing it. Um, last time was in like, you know, normal times. We could sit in person and talk and have fun. Um, and there were we snacks. Were, That's how I and, got and people And there were snacks. Come. We had like a lot mm -hmm. of snacks. So hopefully you have some <laughs> snacks and you're, you're grubbing right now. But again, really appreciate it. Really appreciate Ashley's, um, her, her ingenuity to even say, hey, here, here are some chasms. You know, here are some gaps in the way that we're moving through this particular part of the university and the students experience and I want to be able to enrich it to the best of my ability. So Ashley, again, thank you so much. And I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Shante. And just welcome everyone. We really appreciate you being here. Um, and we're excited to, more than anything, I'm excited to hear about our student experiences while they studied abroad. Um, some just recently got back weeks ago, um, whereas others studied abroad last spring. Uh, and you'll hear all about that soon. So I'm going to start sharing my screen with everyone. And please bear with me. I admit that I am not the most technologically savvy person. Uh, so if anything goes wrong, we're going to get through it together. Can everyone see my screen? Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, well, this session is called Being Black Abroad. Really the point is to just explore what the experience is like um, in a different intercultural space uh, of our ABC identified students. Um, I will provide a lot of context about study abroad in the US, about uh, Americans traveling in general, and then we'll dive a lot deeper into specifics. Um, so Shante already introduced herself. Uh, so I guess I'll um, just provide a little bit more context about who I am. My name is Ashley Bayman. I use she, her, AGA pronouns. Um, I'm a study abroad program coordinator and advisor. I've been here at UCSC for a little more than two years in different capacities. Um, but really, I'm just so grateful to be able to even speak in this space with you all based on my own personal experiences as an ABC identified student who was able to study abroad three times. Um, I started out in community college, and when I was taking a Spanish class, I first learned about the opportunity to go to Mexico for four weeks during the summer. Uh, so that was my first study abroad experience. And then when I finally transferred into the university, I think I was 25 when I finally got to the university. So considered a non-traditional student, transfer student, a female of color, low income student, first generation college student. Uh, so statistically, you know, study abroad really wasn't in the cards for me, but I sought out the opportunity and I made it happen. Uh, so as I said, when I got into the university, I studied abroad once during another summer program in Brazil and also uh, for a whole semester in Argentina. And each one of those experiences were so different for me. Um, and I'll give personal anecdotes throughout the presentation. But again, like, when I graduated college, I had no idea what I wanted to do. And because of those study abroad experiences, they kind of all led me to be in the space to talk to you guys now. So 
again, just so much uh, gratefulness to, to speak with you all today. So of course, we want our panelists to introduce themselves. Would you guys all just like give a brief introduction, maybe in the order that you guys are here on the slide? Starting with Chelsea. Sure. Yeah, um, my Wi-Fi is a little unstable. So if you need me to repeat anything, just let me know. But hello, everyone. My name is Chelsea Boykin. My pronouns are she, her, hers. And I'm a graduating senior, about to get out of here. And I just, I studied abroad my junior year in Barbados. And I was gone for two quarters, um, winter and spring, and I was there for a semester. That's it. Aya? Hi, uh, my name is Aya, or Aya Deli, and I'm an environmental studies major. And I just this past winter quarter studied abroad in Cordoba, Spain, and it was awesome. I had a great time. It was about three months, I think, maybe a little less than three months. Yeah. Hi, everyone. My name is Tulu Famaloni, and I'm a fifth year graduating as well. Um, and I recently just came back from Paris, um, studying abroad um, winter 2020. Hi, my name is Alexis, she, her pronouns. I'm a creative writing major, and I also just came back from Paris this past winter quarter um, studying there. Great. Thank you guys so much, and I'll have a lot more to share later with you all. Um, but really, just to provide some context, um, I really want this session, you know, we have an idea of what we want to present about and what we might talk about, but we really want to hear from you all, like, what do you actually want to know about when it comes to the study abroad experience? So I've never done a poll before. I'm trying it out with this. Can you guys see that? Wait, no, you can't because it says launch poll. All right, let's see if this actually works. Can you guys see that? Okay, cool. So you want to just take a minute and answer the question here. And if any responses aren't here, just pick other and you can type them into the chat box. And I'll give just a few minutes. Yeah, so far I see a lot of people have chosen, you know, experiencing culture shock and cultural transitions. That's something I think that our panelists will really be able to speak to. Um, safety, health, and wellness. Making friends is a top one. I'm gonna end the poll now so we can see our results. Okay, so experiencing culture shock and cultural transitions. That's really what this presentation is based upon, um, understanding what it's like to navigate new intercultural spaces. Um, so we'll definitely talk about that. And again, I really want this to be an informal conversation between all of us. Yes, I guess I'll be leading it and facilitating it, but you know, if you all have personal anecdotes that you wanna add, um, if I'm not saying something properly and you'd be like, oh, wait, but what about this? Please add to it. This is, this is a space for all of us to really connect with one another over this subject. And I'm not going to act like I know everything because I absolutely don't. Um, so just so you have an idea of what we're actually going to discuss. First, I really want to start uh, by providing some context to this conversation. So really looking at like who's actually studying abroad where are they going and why should you do it? What's even the value of studying abroad while, during your academic uh, undergraduate degree experience? Um, next, we'll look at you know, different considerations one should have as an ABC identified student when they're navigating new intercultural spaces and really exploring like what expectations you might have by country. So what might it, might it look like to be an ABC identified student in a majority black country rather than in a you know, uh, majority Asian country, for example. Um, finally, I'll end with just giving some tidbits on how to get started, and then we'll have time for a Q&A of our panel. But panelists, please, please chime in during any part of this conversation. 
So before diving into like study abroad in general, we thought it was good to provide a framework for American travel in general. Um, there was a Forbes national study that was conducted last year. And here you can read some statistics, but overall, um, especially when we look at the United States compared to other countries in the world, Americans don't travel as much as others. Um, I think the national statistic for those who hold passports is only 40%. So less than half of all of our, uh, all of the folks here in the US. Um, and this is for different reasons, right? One, you know, financial reasons, financial restrictions for me being able to travel outside of the country to maybe just not being prepared to, you know, navigate different spaces. Some have fears of like, you know, language barriers or cultural bar barriers, whatever those might be. Um, but also the United States is huge. We have a lot of uh, different um, geographies here that we get the opportunity to take advantage of. So obviously it makes more sense that, you know, Europeans are traveling more because they just have better access to different countries um, more than we do. So then when we look at that, only 40% of you know, US citizens actually hold passports, then it should come as no surprise that only 3% of undergraduate students actually study abroad. So I think the last statistics, I think it was like 300,000 some students actually study abroad um, in the academic years 17, 18. Um, and we have like 17 to 18 million students enrolled in higher ed total. So it's a very small percentage, but out of that already very small percentage, only 6.1% of those students identify as black or African-American. So we um, as a community are highly underrepresented in this you know, high impact educational opportunity. And the only way that we can increase representation is by coming together and having these conversations and learning about what the experience is like when we actually do go abroad. Um, looking at where students are going. So um, historically, Europe has received the majority of our study abroad students. And really it comes as no surprise, right? I mean, in the media, we're always seeing these beautiful pictures of the Eiffel Tower, of all these historic landmarks in, in Europe, which are, you know, breathtaking. They call it the old world for a reason when you're walking down cobblestone streets and looking at the architecture and learning about, you know, societies and civilizations that existed there from the early thousands, you're really blown away. Um, but there is so much more in the world. Um, we can see Latin America comes up uh, behind Europe at 16%, 12% in Asia, only 6% in Africa. Um, so, you know, we're trying to not only increase participation, but also increase participation in what we call non-traditional locations. Um, in fact, if a student is looking to study abroad in a non-traditional location, which is anywhere outside of Europe, there are so many scholarship opportunities available. So just something to keep in mind when exploring different opportunities. So I guess getting into the more important part, like why are we even talking about this? Why do we care? Why should students actually study abroad? Um, there's a lot of personal growth that happens when one studies abroad. I remember, I think Tulu, you talked about it in a survey that you filled out for us, like your increase in confidence of just like moving yourself like independently through different, you know, I think you talked about your independent trip to Portugal, which I hope you'll speak on later. Um, uh, but yeah, yeah. absolutely. The confidence. No, I'm sorry. No, I was just agreeing with you. Absolutely. There's a lot of confidence that you build and just um, your self independence and just seeing what you can actually overcome and what, what you can do. Thank you. Um, and also going abroad to learn a new language. Uh, Aya, I know you mentioned that one of the reasons that you're really excited to study in Spain was to learn Spanish. You want to speak to that quickly? Yeah, it was really fun. And like, I, I mean, in California, we pretty much learn Mexican Spanish. And so it was very different um, learning Spain Spanish. I don't know if that makes sense. Like the dialect was very different, but it was still really awesome. And I think um, beneficial in, in, in building my confidence in Spanish in general. Absolutely. Um, I think all of our panelists could agree that as much learning happens outside of the classroom as inside of the classroom, if not more learning happens outside of the classroom because you're always in these different 
spaces and interacting with different people and having different conversations, something that just doesn't happen to the same extent when you're at UCSC. Yes, you're navigating different spaces and, you know, engaging with different people. But when you look at it in the cultural context sense, you learn about the culture inside of the classroom, but you actually experience the culture when you're outside of the classroom. Um, you develop so many new relationships. Um, students go abroad for heritage seeking reasons or to participate in a diasporic community. Um, so that's where you go abroad to connect with, you know, any your ancestral roots or any community that has historical, cultural ties to you or your family. Um, a lot of people don't realize all of the career preparedness um, that study abroad actually instills in you. I mean, you could study abroad and participate in an internship, for example, or you can conduct international research or just all the different soft skills you gain, like flexibility, adaptability, um, working with people di from diverse communities, um, all look great on a resume. And um, if you study abroad on like a faculty-led program where you're really gaining a close relationship with faculty, that's someone who can, you know, later, you can use to write um, uh, a recommendation letter for graduate school admissions. Um, clarifying your own interests and life goals, that's the only reason I'm here talking to you now. I had no idea what I wanted to do after I graduated college with a degree in Spanish and Latin American studies. And now I'm in this space where I can get other students to participate in, in what put me in this space in the first place. And then really looking at exploring your own identity. So I have this quote here from a student um, she was an ABC student who studied abroad in West, West Africa. And she said that when she was abroad, she had this realization that at one point, I was almost experiencing the opposite of what I had grown up with. Because being in the US as an African American and someone who grew up in predominantly white schools, I was always very aware of my race. I would have moments when I'd be sitting in class, just listening, whatever. And then I look around and see, oh, actually, I'm the only person of color in this whole classroom. But in Western Africa, I really was able to live without that being a factor at all. I never thought about it, except when I was realizing that I just fit in. So really being able to connect to yourself in a way that you might not have anticipated. So we're gonna go into some different study abroad considerations. This is not you know, an all-inclusive list. Um, if there's other considerations we don't talk about, please let me know, but let's get a little bit of the 411. So, Whenever someone asks me, like, what are the most salient parts of my identity? I might say, you know, being a multiracial female, being an equity-minded pr practitioner, uh, being a Midwesterner, what have you. But I never think to say, oh, I'm American. Like, my American identity is something that strongly defines me. Um, <clears throat> and really, when you think about it, we have, as ABC folks, a complicated relationship with the US, just given like looking at historical context. Um, and in looking at these complicated feelings about our relationship to, uh, relationship to America, um, abroad it might be you know, difficult or even confusing identifying and confronting our Americanness. But while we're abroad, we may have to because a lot of the values that we hold are inherently American such as free speech, independence, equality, directness, and formality, individuality, um, all of which might dis differ from the host country cultural norms. I remember in speaking with Chelsea, she was just talking to me about, you know, I didn't realize that it was even a privilege to be able to talk about different issues that we can hear in the US, like abortion or, you know, issues that affect the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, so in certain respects, you know, we might find ourselves in the position of defending, uh, America or American values when we're also critiquing it while we're here in a country. Um, something else that might happen when we're abroad as an ABC student is not being identified as American. Uh, I've had students tell me like, yeah, I was in, um, China. And I'd say that I was American and they'd be like, but no, where are you really from? Because I don't think this comes out of, you know, uh, a place of spite, but more just like ignorance because the media has represented 
people from the US in a certain light, typically being white, blonde, etc. Here I want to share a video from a student who uh, studied abroad in England and what it was like not um, being identified as American because of his skin color. So let me make sure you guys can hear this. Wait, maybe you can't. Videos are always tricky. Um, okay. Can you guys hear it? Can't hear it. Okay. Let me see. So one thing. So you may have to unshare, and then before you share it again, there's a there's the, um, a box in the left hand corner that allows you to share the sound when you share the video. It's black. Can you hear it now? Being a black American in yes. England, I think, or maybe just in Europe, but specifically here, because a lot of people ask me more here than anywhere else, is like, are you really American? Like, what do you think American looks like? Like, they have this concept that Americans are like white. That's problematic. Like, um, they ask me, like, I'm like, oh, American. They're like, oh, but what really are you? It's like, someone in America said that, that would be so racist. Next question is like, are your parents American? It's like, yes. Oh, are their parents American? Yes. They were all freaking born here. Unless you go back 200 years ago, then they weren't. They're like, oh, well, you look Caribbean or you look like you're from Somalia or like South Africa. And I'm like, yes, well, I'm pretty sure somewhere down the line, my three does go back there, but just because my skin color is that way now does not mean I'm not American. I was born in America. I'm full-fledged American. Like, oh, like, like how did you get to America? Like, why are you over there? It's like, what do you think America's comprised of? Like, it does not make any sense. Okay, let me try to switch back to my AirPods. Can you guys hear me now? Yep, okay, cool. So yeah, I just thought that uh, that video, like he's in England, like a country that, you know, is supposed to have such close ties to the U.S. and yet that ignorance still exists. Um, another consideration when studying abroad is, you know, the shift in privilege. Um, in the U.S., we do have a higher average annual salary than many countries in the world. In fact, I'd almost say all except for those in Europe and the UK. Um, so really, you know, identifying as a low income student in the US is going to look really different when you're in a different cultural context, depending on, you know, the um, e economics of that particular country that you're traveling to. You can see some of the statistics here on average annual salaries. Um, another thing we don't think about is just the privilege that we have to access a higher education. Um, in many countries in the world, you know, there still exists gender inequality in education, and you can see what those look like, what some of those countries are here. Um, but also just having the privilege to study abroad. I mean, just the privilege of having a U.S. passport um, opens so many more doors than what other uh, people from other places have access to. Um, so, you know, being able to study abroad and may, you may or may not have to get, have to get a visa depending, depending on how long you're there. So just some things to keep in mind um, when you're in these different cultural contexts. But also looking at what does discrimination abroad actually look like? Um, I have some examples here um, along with different quotes from students. And again, this is not an all-inclusive list discrimination takes form in many ways, but these are just some things that we've heard about from students. So the first one is having comments made about one's appearance. Uh, a student who studied abroad in Italy said uh, she heard, or people would question like, are you sure you're not Roma? Because you look Roma to me. Roma is a, a minority population or minoritized group in Italy uh, from India. Um, so they, you know, they have they're, they're people of color who are, are treated really bad in this society and are stigmatized in the society. And just because the student might have shared their skin color, they were automatically presumed to identify as that group. Um, the students have also talked about experiencing, okay, this word is always, it gets me every time, fetishization <laughs> and objectification. So one student said, um, while we were touring, many of the patrons were asking to touch my hair, 
take pictures of me and with me and openly stared as they walked past me. This is a student who studied abroad in China. And in fact, I experienced this myself. I used to lead programs um, for high school students abroad. And I took a group of students to Mexico once and um, two of my students had braids in their hair. And one time we went to a mall and we saw this group of people just taking pictures of us. And so I went up to them like, why are you taking pictures of us? Like that's super rude doing that without asking our permission. They're like, we're just so blown away by their hair. We've never seen anything like it before. Um, some people go abroad and experience language discrimination. So let's say you study abroad in a predominantly black country, like the student who studied in Botswana um, even though you might identify just based on skin color alone, there are all these other, you know, uh, ways that you experience cultural dissonance, one in language, you know, people might say, oh, you don't speak Suana, what are you even doing here then? Um, and then finally, something that we might not think about initially, but experiencing microaggressions from peers and host nationals. So a student said, when a host country professor asked if race was still an issue in the United States, the white kids were like, no, we don't think so. You know, we have a black president now, so life is great. So I was like, mm, okay, once again, you don't have to go through some of the things that I do, but okay. And I said, no, I think it is still very much an issue in America as well. And then they looked at me again, like, oh, this girl. So this is a student who was studying abroad in India. And I can speak, you know, based on my own experience, um, when I studied abroad in Brazil, I was the only student of color out of 25 other students. And just be like, I felt that the students that I were with were very culturally insensitive. Um, so I only actually ended up making one friend. And the reason that we bonded was because we were both genuinely interested in Brazilian culture and learning the Portuguese language. Um, so in a sense, that was an isolating experience for me. Could I add something? Please. Um, in terms of like the the classroom experience that reminded me I was in my program everyone was from a UC so everyone spoke English but our um, history professor even though he taught the history class in like Spanglish some English and some Spanish he wasn't super comfortable speaking English and we had a discussion about um, like feminism in Spain and the political sphere and one of the students brought up machismo and he was comparing it to feminism and this is an American student and I disagreed with him but it was kind of hard to have that discussion be facilitated by a professor who didn't speak English confidently um, so it ended up not being as productive a discussion as it could have been because of the language barrier and although I felt comfortable speaking in Spanish the other student didn't feel comfortable speaking in Spanish so we had the discussion in English and the professor didn't really moderate it as well as it could have been moderated because of the language barrier. So I think that's something that is definitely um, worth mentioning because it's not always the students from the host university, but sometimes, you know, the other American students that are with you. Absolutely. Great, great example, Aya. Thank you. Um, so now we're kind of going to dive a little bit deeper and look at, you know, obviously the experience studying abroad as an ABC student is going to look different for every single person who does it. But there might be certain, you know, successes and challenges that you um, experience while you're in different spaces. And we're going to explore that a little bit more and really get insight from our panelists about this. So first, just these are broad strokes of different successes and challenges that we've read about in the literature and anecdotally. So looking at like what the experience might be in predominantly black countries. Different successes students have talked about is connecting with heritage, so learning more about their ancestral roots, cultural roots, historical roots, what have you. Um, being part of the majority for the first time, you know, experiencing racial freedom and just looking around and everyone looking like you. That's something myself that I experienced when I went to Brazil. It's a very mixed heritage culture and I didn't realize the extent of, of what that really meant until I was there. And I was like, wow, every, I mean, you, you see people across the spectrum and they're a very united nation in Brazil. So that was a different experience for me. Um, you may gain a deeper understanding of self. So maybe by the end of it, you're more equipped to answer questions about who you are and where you came from. And then finally, hair care, slaying on a budget, um, because you are in a country 
in which many people have similar identity, physical identity markers as you. Um, you can get your hair done for the cheap. You can find all the good hair care products. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, and then looking at some of the different challenges that students might experience in these spaces. Um, one, cultural dissonance. So not feeling a part of or accepted by the host culture. Now this could take place, you know, maybe there's a language barrier um, or maybe, you know, there's just many different cultural uh, differences that while you may look like a part of the culture, uh, culturally speaking, you're very different because again, as we talked on earlier, those inherent American values that you hold. Um, some students experience unmet expectations, so not feeling connected the way you thought you would. This might happen if, you know, you're an American abroad, and so you might be exploited like many Americans are, you know, um, where, when it comes to bargaining or, you know, being charged higher prices or whatever it might look like. Um, but then on, some students have uh, expressed, you know, um, hurt and confusion when they may have studied abroad in a predominantly black country, but then their white peers get more attention to, than them because the people of that country are not as used to seeing their white peers. So then there's those tensions that way as well. Um, and then the final thing I wanted to talk on was just, you know, a repression of other identities. So yes, you may be in a country where the, for the first time everyone looks like you, but then now you have to repress these other parts of yourself. So the one example I pulled here is being black and queer abroad. So just looking at this here, if you were to study in Africa, there are four countries where you can be executed for identifying as part of the LGBTQIA plus community. And then there's many other countries where it's illegal. And this is not just in Africa, but in many um, other countries around the world where there is a, a lack of acceptance for people from the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, again, this is just one example of what that might look like. And now quickly going to look at some of the successes and challenges when we study abroad in a predominantly white and or Asian country. Um, so some students have actually talked about experiencing racial freedom in these spaces. Um, they reported that the color of their skin didn't matter in places like France. You only felt different because you were American. You didn't feel different because you were black. Again, going back to what we talked about at the beginning of the presentation. Um, there's a lot of cross-cultural learning that takes place, you know, just seeing the influence that African-American culture has had throughout the world. So listening to hip-hop in Korea and Korean hip-hop or experiencing jazz in Copenhagen, it's just really incredible to see all, how our culture has permeated, you know, the entirety of the world in so many different ways. Um, and just experiencing empowerment, you know, successfully moving your body and your belongings through foreign train and transportation systems. I mean, especially in Europe where you're taking the train everywhere, missing the train, talking to someone about how to get on the next train, overcoming all of these different, you know, language barriers that you may experience um, is a really empowering feeling. But at the same token, there are that much more challenges when you're in these spaces. So, you know, anti-blackness is real here in the US and all around the rest of the world. Um, looking at Europe specifically, there is a current refugee crisis there. So black students have talked about being misidentified as belonging to other minoritized groups um, and may experience discrimination based on how the groups are stigmatized, like we saw with the student who studied abroad in Italy being identified as Roma. Um, students also experience stereotypes. So, you know, people assuming that because you're a black American abroad, that you must be a celebrity or a singer or actor or a basketball player. Um, we used to have an EOP counselor who studied abroad in Hong Kong and he was a tall black male and everyone thought he was a basketball player while he was studying abroad. And, you know, they weren't like, oh, you're this basketball player, like he looked like someone. No, it was just because he was tall and black. Um, uh, while we talked about in, in the other slide, you know, being able to slay on a budget when you're in predominantly black country and predominantly white or Asian countries, there is a very limited hair care. In fact, when I said you're brought in Argentina, I brought like 
two huge things of just shampoo and conditioner because I didn't think I'd be able to find it while I was down there. Um, and because, you know, maybe the country where you're going to, people don't share your same physical identity markers. So being conscious of that. Um, but also racial isolation as a thing, you know, being the only ABC student on the city abroad program, I shared with that experience just like for me in Brazil. And I don't know if any of our other panelists will speak to it later, but you know, when you're in a program with 20 plus students and you're the only one who identifies as you, you know, you don't have anyone who you can really share that experience or reflect on what the experience is like. You're, you're more so like trying to internalize these things yourself, which can be really difficult. Um, but I feel like I've just talked way too much and I really want to uh, give this over to our panelists because their experiences are the reason that we're here. So we're going to go from panelist to panelist. So have each three to five minutes to talk um, about some of the successes, challenges that they experienced while they were in their study abroad countries and what it was really like to be them and navigate those different intercultural spaces. So without further ado, I am going to hand it over to Chelsea. Okay. Um, um, I studied abroad in Barbados really because I was tired of being at a PWI and just not being the, just being a minority. So I wanted to go to a country that was going to be the, I was going to be in the majority. So I chose Barbados and honestly, it was the best thing I could have did. I think it retained me to continue my education afterwards. And I'm so blessed to have that experience. And so one of my big successes is that before I went to Barbados, I'd never been outside the U.S. Like how Ashley was saying, that I, was, I got my passport just to go study abroad. Like, and so I was really nervous before I went, but my biggest success when getting there was really emerging myself into the campus community. And so in the school I went to, they had different Caribbean islands um, organizations and so each week they would have their own type of week where they would share their culture so they'll basically have like food like say on Wednesdays or they'll go like a party on Fridays and so I really tried to like go to all of them and anything I was being hosted because I thought I was only going to meet people from Barbados but I, lost, I met a lot of people from other Caribbean islands and lands and so it was very powerful for me to see so many different types of blackness in that space and just understanding that we come from different places, but we have like general understanding for certain things. And so that was really my big success is being more social than I usually am in the United States, because if you know me, I really like to mind my business. Um, but I tried my best. I was out there doing my best going outside. I met two people who also were from the UC system and we became really close friends and I also live where I lived I live with other people from the island of Grenada and Jamaica we came pretty close and we started to hang out a lot and so that was pretty that was a really big success for me some of the challenges for me was that cultural norm of being American so like there's certain things that we just grow up learning like where I'm from but if I talk about it like say like abortion and things like that, it was kind of like taboo or like we never talked about that growing up. And so at times it was, my ideas seem kind of radical to people. And I'm like, this is just normal to me. Like, this is just what I know. And that was kind of a challenge, but it really wasn't too big. Like it, it didn't stop me at all. If anything, it made me understand like the history of like how people are taught certain things or not taught other things. Um, and then, I really did like just smoothly glide into being in Barbados. I looked like everybody there. So everybody thought I was from a different island. I would tell them, you know, I was from this island this day and they would believe it. Um, so I, I got away with a lot of stuff. But um, I think that it was something that I really wanted. Like I just love being around Black people and being surrounded by such greatness, really. And so navigating my identity was really easy for me. And yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chelsea. Um, going on to Blue. 
Hi. Hello. So, yeah, so I studied abroad in France. And honestly, I just, I feel like I had a really great experience for study abroad. And I feel blessed to be able to say that. Um, but I honestly did not think I was even going to be able to study abroad because um, I, I am studying engineering and I, I don't know of many people in engineering that were able to study abroad. But luckily, I don't know, I was able to finesse my schedule around a little bit and I stayed a fifth year so that I would be able to take a quarter and go. And I just knew that with this opportunity, I wanted to make the most of it, like literally just say yes to everything and try to do everything that I could because um, I have two sisters and they both studied abroad and like my younger sister studied abroad like three or four times. So I was just like, this is my, this is my opportunity. And um, I feel like some of my successes were the fact that I, I feel like I really did take advantage of every opportunity. I was able to like squeeze in a lot of traveling um, while I was there. Uh, I went to a hundred countries. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. I was, I was able to squeeze in eight different countries um which just seems so cool and i can't even believe I, i'm able to say that right now but um just uh taking advantage of every opportunity and really putting myself out there like i kind of i know i'm a outgoing person but i didn't know to what extent i was and it really took me you know being in a, in a different country um to really push myself out of my box um, and meet new people and be independent. Like if people, because if people didn't want to go to um, or, or get involved with anything that I wanted to do, I just went on my own. And um, that's how a solo trip happened to Portugal. So I was just like, nobody wants to go to Portugal. I'm going to go by myself. And um, <clears throat> it was one of the best experiences I've ever had. So, um, yeah, I would say successes were just like being able to really take advantage of every opportunity. Um, some of the challenges, I, I don't know, I feel like, um, I don't, I'm not going to say I didn't face any challenges, but there wasn't anything that's just like standing out. Wow, that was really hard for me. I feel like France was great. Um, I know you mentioned earlier that you, we don't really, or students have reported not really feeling um, like they stick out in France. And I, I actually agree with that. I feel like there's a lot of diversity in France. And um, while the language barrier was a little hard, um, it, it was a good challenge because it's like, okay, I want to learn this new language and it's going to encourage me to do that. And I feel like um, the Parisians were really um, <laughs> understanding and they actually worked with me. And as long as they saw that I was trying, um, like people were really accepting of it. And then, um, how did my identity as an ABC STEM student play? So the only time I really felt my like engineering background kind of um, come into a f or have a have an effect on my time there was in my classes, honestly, because I was taking a lot of GE classes um, or classes that weren't related to my major. And so there were history, language classes, and I was just not used to writing papers and reading essays, which I probably should. I know I should. I know I should read more and practice my writing, but I just have been out of practice. And so I think that was the only time that I really felt my STEM background come into effect. But yeah. Great. Thank you, Tulu. And again, you guys will be able to ask many more questions um, once we get through the presentation. But next, Aya. Hey, so I studied in Cordoba, Spain, which is in the south of Spain. Um, and some of my successes, I think, was, well, being able to study abroad in the first place, like my parents didn't want me to go. But I learned to convince them and I created a very detailed spreadsheet with a lot of information. <laughs> like, you know, how long the program was and um, different benefits. This specific program was focused on Andalusian and Islamic art and my family were Muslim so it was really important to look at the Muslim history there and it was really interesting because like um, Ashley said there's a lot of rich history in Europe and it's so old like you're in these buildings that are thousands and thousands of years old so that was something that definitely attracted me to the program that I was in. Um, also we got to go to Morocco 
and that was so fun. I had been to Morocco previously with my mom, but we went to the south, and this trip took us to the north, um, and we had some really, um, really cool conversations with the young people in Morocco, and I noticed on the list Morocco was one of the places that LGBTQ plus people, uh, it's not allowed, like it's illegal, um, but in those conversations, all the students were really open to having those conversations about whether it's religion or their identity as African or like an Arab and kind of relating to anti-Blackness. And I was kind of curious about if you're, if you speak Arabic, do you identify as someone who's African, you know? Um, so we had some really cool conversations. Um, in Spain, I was one of three Black students. Um, in my program. So I got lucky to have some people who could share my experiences and some of the struggles that I faced, whether it was just being stared at or a couple times like an old guy would just be really blatantly rude to us or make us uncomfortable. Um, and in those times, I think I built my confidence because I would try to talk to him in Spanish, like, what do you want from us? Like, can I help you type thing? Or just ignore it and move on because you know, sometimes that would ex exasperate the situation. Um, I think those, that would be the only time that I experienced like an overt challenge of someone like publicly staring at me or saying something. Um, but overall, everyone in my program was so friendly and so nice. Our Spanish teacher had a, a very clear bias towards the white students. <laughs> she preferred the white, blonde haired, blue eyed students over us, other students who were either who were not white basically and so that was a bit difficult and I don't think it ever really got addressed but I do think that it pushed me to do better than them not in like they were good people but just in that proving that race has nothing to do with your ability to learn a language you know so um that's something that I also experienced um and then my identity I I really think that I'm I'm also pretty outgoing so I think that helped because in that in that the program is not very long. So I kind of had to just jump right in and take advantage of in the first week, oh, we're gonna do a language um, kind of exchange program, like just signing up for that and really putting myself out there and speaking the language because that was a really big goal of mine. Um, along with traveling to other cities in Spain, um, the program didn't really facilitate that much local travel. So pretty much everyone in the program would go to a different city every weekend or go to Portugal or, um, or, or France or something like that. So, yeah. And Aya, quickly, do you want to speak about um, the challenge of the cultural norm of kissing? <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. So, I was with the host family, and my host mom uh, would, they told us at the beginning of orientation that your host mom's going to kiss you like on each cheek. And my actual mom was there because we, she had traveled with me to Spain. And so, like, when I met my host mom, she, like, kissed me on both cheeks. It was really, it was, I wasn't expecting it, even though they told me. And I'm used to ki cheek kisses, because a lot of my friends and family are, like, Pakistani, Afghani, and they do the cheek kiss, too. But it's the other side. It's not the right to left. It's left to right. Anyway, we ended up creating a schedule. We, we understood after, after um, lunch, we would do a cheek kiss, and that's how I knew lunch was over. <laughs> because it was super awkward we'd just be sitting there like okay can I leave now like I didn't want to be rude you know so if I got up gave her a cheek kiss I was like okay deuces I'll go to my room now um so yeah that was kind of uh, an interesting culture cultural difference for sure <laughs> thank you Aya and last but certainly not least Alexis hi um my name is Alexis uh I studied in Fran Paris France this past winter quarter um one reason I kind of chose this program which was a social justice and activism program was like because I'm a lit major and I was like what can I do where do lit majors go and I was like I was doing all the research and this one I guess fit me the most because that's something activism is something I'm like also interested in besides literature um so I chose this program and I also always been wanting to go to France since like high school and like studying French and like all my teachers would tell me about like where they were from and I was like okay so I have to go there so it fit perfectly for me and yeah that's why I ended up in that program um some successes I had um for me it's mostly like traveling alone because this was also my first time going out of the country 
um, let alone by myself. Um, so like just navigating a whole new city, a whole new country was like really, like I was proud of myself for doing that just in 10 weeks, so, like the 10 weeks we had. Um, so yeah, and also like once getting in Paris, like traveling to and from places like the school and like the metro system was like really freaking me out at first. And I was like, even taking the buses in Santa Cruz, sometimes I would get on the wrong bus and I'm just like, wait. So I was already nervous about that, but like I ended up figuring it all out. Um, so like, that was one thing, like it might seem little like just traveling, but like I am always fearing getting lost. So like I didn't get lost. So I was, that was successful for me. Um, another success, I guess, like it kind of led me to wanting to travel more in the future. Cause like traveling, I didn't really think too much about like after school, but now I kind of want to go more places with like my friends and family in the future when I'm done with school. So I guess it kind of sparked the traveling bug in me. Um, and also returning to Paris is also something I really want to do um yeah some challenges I guess were I battled like homesickness like halfway through the quarter so like that was one struggle for me the most because I never really got homesick before so this was my first time really feeling that and what that really meant so I guess trying to um navigate what it meant to be homesick and like what I was missing and what I was not doing so kind of after that, like trying to get over it, like I started like exploring more a little by myself, like solo trips to cafes, I guess. Um, just going, I went to parks was like one of the favorite things I did, like just parks and the gardens there. So I'd like explored a couple of those by myself. And those were like really relaxing for me because that's like, I like chill, to do chill things, I guess. So like the gardens and parks were like my go-to spots. Like on the way to school, I would like stop at the garden or something. So yeah that was um a challenge for me but like I kind of got over kind of yeah but and also navigating um a white European country um I like in what the student said earlier about France not being like too much of a challenge in terms of like being black and not finding your space in the country because like I did feel like more because there was this one time me and my roommate we went to an Italian restaurant in Paris and we sat next to a white couple and like I kind of saw like stairs but I was like more curious if like it was because we were speaking English and not French versus like whether we were black I was black and like she was Asian I was like I don't think it's really that it's, I think it was like oh what are they're not speaking French what are who are they so I was like I just noticed small things like that so yeah um, that was interesting for me and also like in terms of like my black identity out there there were like some things I would try to do like there was one night we went to like this dance club thing and they were playing like it was like hip-hop R&B night and once I went once we went in there I was like I bet there's going to be a whole bunch of black people there and I was like hella excited like before going and like there was they were playing Drake, LMA, Beyonce and I was like wait <laughs> so I was like that was a good night so just like seeing like a room full of black people was like really cool for me. Um, so yeah, that was a fun, that was something fun. But yeah, the student really highlighted when they said like, it's more of like American versus like European. And I really understood that um, with this trip. So yeah, those are just like some highlights, I guess. Thank you, Alexis. Honestly, I have so many follow-up questions for all of you guys. Uh, but I don't know how this space and all the way into the Q and A. But thank you guys so much for sharing your experiences. Um, this is the part that I was most excited about myself. Um, so now I'm just gonna quickly go through this because I really want to open it up to Q and A. Um, but like maybe after listening to everything now, you might be like, okay, I'm interest interested. But how do I actually get started on this? So the very first thing you have to do if you're a student who wants to study abroad is you have to complete a study abroad profile. Um, if you go to the website listed here, studyabroad.ucsc.edu, at the very top of the screen, there's a place that says Slugs Abroad. You go to it, you sign in with your cruise ID, and really it's just going to ask you different questions about like um, academics. It'll ask you student identity questions so that it can also provide you with resources. It'll explain the different types of programs that you can participate on as a UCSC student. 
Um, so once you complete the study abroad profile, then you can actually explore programs. We have five different program types to choose from. So there's UCSC faculty led programs where you go abroad during summer session with UCSC faculty and majority UCSC students. Um, we have global, ex global and domestic exchanges where you pay UCSC tuition and you pay the living expenses abroad. So you're kind of like trading spots with a student from another institution for a semester. Um, the University of California Education Abroad Program, which is called UCEAP for short, is the program that all of our students here participated on. Um, it's a UC system-wide provider. So students from all the UCs can go on UCEAP programs. They have like hundreds of programs in over 40 countries. They have a huge portfolio. Um, and then you can go on other UC programs. So like UC Davis, UC Berkeley, UCSD, they all offer their own study or prop programs that you can participate on. And then there's also non-UC programs. So they're not affiliated with the UC, but sometimes they have opportunities that the UCs don't. Like if you wanna study abroad in Iceland, for example, I don't know any other UC that offers a program in Iceland. So you can find that through this non-UC option. And of course, if you speak with a study abroad advisor, we'll explain more to you. Um, so yeah, once you've created the profile, once you've reviewed programs a little bit, or you don't even have to review programs, you can just do it with me or whoever you meet with, um, you can schedule an appointment to meet with one of us. So you do that by either calling the number here at the bottom or emailing global at ucsc.edu. If you're on a study abroad website, you just go to about and meet the staff and you'll get the information on who you would speak to, but any of us are always open to speaking you know, or providing information or answering questions that you might have. Um, quickly looking at what's more, so just so you guys have an idea, I wanted to quickly talk about if you go in a UC program, it's UC credit. So sometimes students are fearful that they'll get transfer credit um, and they won't. If it's a UC program, so those first four program options I discussed, you get UC credit, the classes go on your transcript, it um, factors into your GPA, um, only the non-UC option actually offers transfer credit, but none of the UC options. Um, financial aid goes with you on all UC programs. And um, at UCSC, one cool thing that um, our financial aid office offers is an estimate. So they'll give you a projection of how much aid you'll receive to participate in your program. And maybe later on, um, our panelists can talk about how they actually paid for their study abroad programs, because I know that's often a, a big concern among students. Um, but finally, if paying for your program is like a big concern, there are so many study abroad scholarships. I strongly encourage students to apply for these scholarships because you know there's a lot that exists out there. And sometimes, you know, like we have scholarships on campus, nobody will apply for it but one student. And that one student will get the scholarship because they're the only one who applied. Uh, <clears throat> but um, for example, I know Alexis got the Gilman Scholarship. That scholarship is for Pell Grant recipients, and it can be up to $5,000, um, but you know they have different award amounts. So maybe Alexis, you could speak to that scholarship here in a little bit. Um, I will say I didn't apply for scholarships when I studied abroad because my study abroad advisor really didn't advise me uh, to the different opportunities available, and I'm still paying for those study abroad experiences now. So don't make the same mistakes I did. <laughs> um, but um, if, you know, we briefly talked about like the actual logistics of studying abroad. So if you have any questions, please connect with me. Here's my contact info. I'll also put it in the chat box once we start the Q&A. Um, but yeah, my email's here, my work phone number's here. That's linked to my cell phone right now. So you can get a hold of me anytime. And finally, uh, let's actually get into the student panel Q and A. So Ashley, gonna... can I can I jump in really quick for a second? Yeah, yeah. Because the power, the power of ARC, we have amazing folks that have come oh, through yeah. the center and done really awesome things. And um, you know, 
I don't have favorites. I love everyone, but there's like a good handful of folks that I, you know, particularly have a really strong relationship with. And this person saw the flyer and they were like, oh my God, can I come and talk about my experience in Senegal? And I was like, you sure can. So I did check with Ashley to see if it would be okay. So I've given Lily, uh, Lily's on the phone right now. She graduated um, in 2018, but then spent most of the 2019 school year in Senegal. And she just wanted to share a little bit about her experiences as well. Uh, yeah let me stop sharing and then we can kind of connect <laughs> with each other better and she, she Hi, guys. Minute, so I, I told her that but I think it's just I think it'll add a little bit more um richness to the conversation of someone who you know was a couple years removed but she was just chatting me and saying how this is fabulous and she wishes that more people would get the experience Lily absolutely yes. What's going on, everybody? Hi. Um, so my name's Lily. I graduated 2018, located best class, sorry. Um, and I had the fortunate and the ability to go study abroad in Senegal, um, West Africa. Um, Ella's also on the phone call with me as well. So if, Ella, if you wanna say something, you can. Um, so I kind of forced Ella to come with me to study abroad she was like my psych in crime we much it all together um the whole program was amazing because there's experience that i never got like growth um as well as like, the ability to just claim yourself as an individual but in ash's um examples that stated there's some success experience experience that which is understanding what you uh, say getting with those two people we have seemed to have like a blast in our program which is amazing um the part of my life i would say as like a chat experience home concerns my mom was really on about like who's gonna live me and the thing was uh, there was like my person um uh, in set work years that he did CAP called CIE Dakar, and we had 12 black men, and then we had the rest was white. And it was kind of hard because we dealt with microaggressions. These students really brought a lot of us together, the black men, and really just come and hold space and really those serious conversations of how to be strong, how to handle things. And it was really the best way because I gained the best of friends through this experience. We traveled a lot together, went through sand dunes together. And so I want to say something, go ahead. Yeah. Um, can you guys hear me okay? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, yeah, like Lily mentioned, we were in Dakar um, fall of 2018. And uh, on my end, it wasn't necessarily something that I plotted and like planned for it just kind of happened and I ended up there but um I think something that is worth mentioning as far as challenges I have two things um for me personally it was uh, a mixture of just language barrier because Senegal is obviously it's a francophone country so um people only spoke french and like their native language which is wolof um and you rarely met people who spoke english so that was definitely a challenge especially when all you want to do is like get a taxi ride and you have to figure out how to like you know um be able to communicate that um so that was definitely a challenge for me but in a lot of ways i think there was um, a lot of growth for me on that end just because um, it meant that I was absorbing language at like such a crazy rate that by the end of it, I was able to carry conversation whether it was in Wolof or in French. Um, and I had a very awesome professor. So when I came back actually last fall, um, I just continued taking French classes um, because I was like very encouraged um and then last thing that i think was like definitely a challenge and definitely worth mentioning is um lily and i we lucked out because we were in a program with like 10 other black women who also came from pwis so we were like this but that meant that 
sad to say, like, all the white women were, like, threatened by it. And so we had to, like, basically have multiple, like, breakout sessions and discussions about why people felt the way that they did. So that was very, mm, I don't know, I just, like, it was it was a challenge to be able to, like, navigate that. Um, and I don't think Senegal is on the study abroad uh, program for uh, UCSC anymore but as far as like black folks who are going to be traveling to predominantly black countries it is nice to look around and see that everyone looks ar like you but you'll find that a lot of the people who are in the program with you are gonna be white women from Indiana who think they could say out-of-pocket things and it's hard to be able to navigate that and know how to communicate. Um, so that's something to definitely be mindful about. Um, and yeah, I, sorry, it's short. If you have any questions, email me. I'll put my email in here, um, but yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for being a part of this call and just adding more breadth of experiences to this conversation. I don't know if UCAP offers Senegal program anymore. I think there's only four um, countries in Africa that they have for now. <clears throat> but um, yeah. now we want to open it up to any questions that anyone here in the audience has for any of our student panelists. And you can feel free to unmute yourself. You can put it in the chat box. Um, yeah. Thank you guys so much. My question is, where, where's your next destination? What, what's your next country? When, when you're able to safely fly <laughs> and enter other countries, where are y'all going? I'm gonna go to Barbados. Thank you, see. <laughs> I'm hoping to go. Uh, <laughs> sorry, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say Thailand. <laughs> yeah, I actually had a trip planned to Thailand and Vietnam um, in June. And I'm so thankful that I procrastinate and didn't buy plane tickets. Um, so I'm hoping I have a wedding that I'm supposed to go to in Ethiopia in like December, but we'll see. God um, willing. I'm hoping, well, I was supposed to go to Singapore in the fall, but they just told me that the program was suspended, so RIP. But hopefully um, I can apply to uh, another program in either winter or over the summer. Um, because my graduation date isn't until fall, so I, I could technically do another program over this summer in Singapore or Thailand, because I really love um, Thai food. I mean, there's other reasons, but <laughs> that's a really big reason after living in Spain, and the food was, um, took some getting used to, so yeah. Um, I want to go to all the Caribbean island and land, but I want to go to St. Lucia because they have waterfalls and I really want to see those. I would definitely go back to Europe. Um, France, I didn't, the, I only stayed in Paris, so I definitely want to discover the rest of France. Um, because why not? <laughs> so yeah. Uh, thank you all. We actually have a question in the chat box. And actually, it's a question that I was going to ask everyone, too. Like, how were you actually able to pay for your study abroad program? And whoever wants to tackle this question, please feel free. So um, it was it was pretty interesting because I first started off with just financial aid. Um, I hadn't saved up any money, but just financial aid. Um, but then I just started traveling so much and then I ran out of money and, uh, uh, but then tax return season came around. So then that was my saving grace. But then I also wanted to do a big trip. I uh, ended up in Cape Town 
but I didn't have enough money to go there. So then my best friend actually helped me pay for a ticket. But, but to be honest, like I don't regret anything. Like I would go into debt to travel and get in all the experiences. And I feel like if you need to go into debt, I mean, I'm not, just, I'm not gonna encourage anything, but I feel like it's worth it. When I'm in debt, I'd be like, Tulu told me to go into debt to travel to, okay. <laughs> Um, I guess I could go next. Um, um, financial aid. And also I worked at the dining hall the quarter before I left. So I guess I saved some money there. And like Ashley mentioned, I, I did receive the Gilman scholarship. Um, I applied to that one, which is, it gave me a good amount to have like spending money while I was in, it, in Paris. Um, and I applied to that one and I applied to the Promise I think it was a Promise Award. Um, I didn't receive that one, but yeah. I don't know if we wanted me to go more into the Gilman, but. What was, yeah, what was the process of applying to a scholarship like? I think a lot of times students are like, you know, think that it's like this big process, which it mm -hmm. can be, but it can also be worth it. So can you just talk about the application process itself and how you actually found out about the different scholarship opportunities? Yeah um well one way i found out was like all the emails and like checking the uceap website and those were like that was one of the main ones listed and also ashley told me about it um in person when i asked um so the application process was like i did applying for scholarships was something like i'd never loved doing like in high school and stuff so like this time I just narrowed it down to like find two main ones and like work on that all summer. So that's what I did. Um, they were both essay based. Um, this one, um, you had to do, I forget how many words, but like you had to do um, a statement about how you would, I think it was how did financial aid help you, or like how did the Gilman help you um, paying for your program and how do you plan on like, affecting your campus I think that was the main like helping your campus with your trip um in terms of community and like getting other people engaged with the scholarship with Gilman um with the Gilman program and like um just studying abroad in general so um yeah I just basically spent so the summer so like three months um working on the paper or essay and like sending it to people having people review it and making sure I could turn it in by September or October, I think it was the end of September when I got back to school that quarter. Um, so yeah, the process was like a little tricky for me, but I made sure to give myself time because sometimes I don't do that. But I knew this wasn't something that could be rushed uh, considering like it was two parts to it. So yeah, I gave myself time to think about because um, the questions they asked me on the application was like made me think about the reason why I want to study abroad kind of how we talked about earlier in the presentation like what it why what do I want to do for myself and what do I want to bring back to the community like once I leave um France so like I guess that was good for me in terms of like getting insight on like what I would be doing abroad before I even left um so yeah yeah Thank you. Um, and then Chelsea also mentioned that she <clears throat> used financial aid and also got two scholarships, including the UCAP Promise Award and uh, the Stevenson College Scholarship. So there are, you know, department scholarships, college scholarships, all offered through UCSC as well. Um, I'll throw this in. I don't know if it's an option anymore. Um, while I was studying abroad, I was working part time, but working remotely. Um, I had, I don't know if it's, it's like an internship, but it was a job um, on campus uh, over at the physical plant. And uh, I just kind of worked with my boss to be able to work remotely. And it was like, I was only working like 10 to 15 hours a week but that translated in like you know in a very big way considering the um like currency difference so if you can work remotely i would <laughs> encourage that thank you
Um, one thing I want to ask about is because three of our panelists actually were abroad during the onset of COVID-19, and I think a few of you had to leave your programs early. What was it like being abroad as all of this was kind of playing out? I mean, obviously, it happened in Europe uh, before it actually spread over here to the U.S. So what was the experience like for you just, you know, being abroad, being away from your family? and hearing about all of this that was going on. Um, I'll go first. My, um, I'll start by saying my program, it actually ended the day that Trump set the deadline for coming back to the US. So uh, my program did not get ended early. Uh, however, um, because, I, because there are people who were on the semester program, their program got ended early. Um, that being said, I wasn't planning on coming back to the U.S. until like March 30th um, instead of March 13th. So I hadn't actually bought a return ticket and that was stressful um, because one, I didn't have that much money left and two, um, I thought I might get stuck in the U.K. Although because of Brexit, technically the UK isn't part of the European Union anymore, and it ended up being that that wasn't the place, one of the places Trump had uh, banned people from going from before saying all people who had US um, American passports could still come back to the US. Um, so it was very, it was, it was hard to get accurate information uh, in terms of what what was actually factually accurate and applied to me as a Amer as a, a pa American passport holding citizen. Um, that was just stressful because the program coordinators didn't, they were learning information as we were, we were, we were learning it. Um, so that was stressful. I was lucky enough to get a flight back that wasn't too expensive. I was using um, Student Universe actually. Yeah, I found a pretty good price, priced flight back. Um, when I got to LAX, it was very hectic and I missed my next flight. And that was mostly because of the whole CDC line that was happening. Um, and they didn't check us actually. Uh, they said they were gonna check us, like check our temperature and check uh, to see if we had, I don't know, been exposed to coronavirus, but they didn't check us. And we just waited in that line for I don't know what reason. Um, it was overall a very stressful experience. I'm I was lucky lucky enough to have a friend traveling with me who also is from the Bay Area. So I had a partner like during that whole process when we we stayed in London for a couple nights and then flew back to California, and that was like a saving grace. Like I'm so thankful for that because I would have been extremely overwhelmed to have have to travel back home by myself while everything that was going on. Um, so yeah. Alexis, did you want to say something? Oh. Um, so I was going to say that I feel like the uh, during our program, or let me at least just speak for my, myself, I feel like it went from zero to 100. Um, and maybe this is my fault for not staying updated with the news and about the outbreak, but uh, it just seemed like one night I, came, I had come back from a trip and then there was an email sent out from our program about how the program got canceled and then I went to sleep and then the next morning everybody had bought flight tickets back home and I was like oh okay um but we still had a week so basically finals the finals week was canceled and we were everybody went back home I was going to stay until my originally um, planned ticket on um, the following Sunday but I'm lucky I didn't because the Tuesday I eventually left was um, the day that France closed their borders to to leave so I just I, I feel like it was uh, a stressful process only in the fact that it just went from zero to 100 and I I just I didn't really know what to do yeah did you have to self-quarantine when you got back to work? I did um, but I was at home, but I was definitely like not going anywhere outside of my home. Yeah, it was kind of, it was kind of tricky, but I definitely did like self quarantine in some capacity. And Alexis, do you wanna share anything about the experience? Yeah, uh, I was actually in the same program as Salu. So like, I agree it was hectic and like, very like what's going on, but actually like, 
me and my roommate, we were like both kind of like worried about the whole case, the number of cases. So we were literally checking the rise of the numbers every single day, like giving each other hourly updates. It kind of got ridiculous, but like it kind of felt like what we had to do. And we kept like being on the phones with our moms. And like my mom was here, like trying to like look up flights like two weeks before like it actually got canceled. And I was like, wait, I so yeah it was hectic um but i ended up getting a flight back home just in time um yeah it was i wish that i'm no one because like the program ending one week before it's supposed to actually end was kind of like a lot of people were disappointed but i just wanted i was concerned mostly like for safety so yeah so yeah do we have any other questions from the audience Uh, we have one here from Monica for Tulu. What factors made you certain that you wanted to stay an extra year for study abroad? Um, <clears throat> so the reason I had to stay an extra year is because with the way my schedule was, um, um, there's like an, a capstone that's a year long. And so I had to do that my fourth year. And so the only reason, the only way I would have some time to go was if I stayed a fifth year. And luckily I had failed a class um, like two years ago that was only offered in the spring quarter. And so I would have a class to come back to. Um, and that really helped for financial aid. Um, but I just, I, I knew I wanted to go abroad just because um, like I said, my, my two sisters had went and they had like amazing experiences. And I was like, I wanna be able to experience this. And I don't want my major to like hold me back. Um, and so I just, I knew, and plus I have a lot of friends that have already graduated and they're like, stay in school as long as you can because post-grad is just, it's not what everybody <laughs> is ex expecting and it's not all it's cut out to be. So I was like, yeah, I could take, you know, I could take some time, you know, enjoy it, um, take some time to explore the world. I was like, I definitely will, I will, yeah, I'll take whatever it takes to do that. Um, Chelsea, would you like to speak to that as well? Because I know you stayed a fifth year for just after studying abroad. No, I'm, this is my last year, my fourth year. Oh, it's your fourth I went year. During, okay. Yeah, I went through my third year, but everybody else in my program was a senior. I was the youngest person, actually. Yeah, actually, juniors, we don't see as many juniors studying abroad as we do seniors. Um, any other questions? If not, um, I will, I'm going to put my information here in the chat box. Feel free to reach out to me. Um, if you ever want to connect with any of our student panelists or um, anyone else who's joined, let me know and maybe I can connect with them to see if they would share their emails as well. Um, but again, just so thankful for everyone taking the time to be here, especially our panelists and those who've shared their experiences with us. So this was so insightful and I just, I thank you guys so much. Of course, it was a pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you everyone, be well. Thank All right, you, you guys. Bye. Bye.